Hey everyone, welcome back to all my listeners. Now I hope you're all having a great day so far because I know I am. Now if it's your first time finding me, thanks so much and welcome. Welcome to episode 15 of season 6. Today is Wednesday, August 10th, 2022. My name is Sonal Patel, and this is the Paint the Medical Picture podcast series. Now, all right, you guys, I've got so much to dive into today. In my compliance tip, I'm going to get us all back to basics with the infamous Incident 2 billing requirements. And that's right, it is the second Wednesday of the month, and that means I'm going to be featuring my newsworthy update on the OIG work plan for July 2022. And I'm going to go ahead and close out today's episode with some inspirational words on vision and leadership from Ishita Gupta. If you've checked me out on LinkedIn, you know I'm all about compliance and protecting our physicians and our valued healthcare professionals when it comes to the business of medicine. I hope this week with me brings you enough to take back to your organizations, to want to dive in deeper, to use my tips and best practices to ensure success. I hope this podcast will help you boost the quality of documentation capture and improve coding accuracy as you help all your providers paint the medical picture. If you like what you're hearing, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button now so you don't miss another episode. Please write in a review and kindly drop me a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to my podcast. I'd really love your support. As always, a friendly disclaimer. Remember, I'm bringing you the news current healthcare industry news, my compliance tips and my recommendations based on my over 12 years of experience in front office, in back end, in coding, in billing for multi-specialty physicians, in compliance, and in auditing for both ENM and surgical operative reports. These are my opinions alone and are not to be construed as legal advice. So let's get into newsworthy. Now, there are six newsworthy OIG work plan updates for the month of July. Now, the first OIG work plan update for July 2022 is titled Medicare Payments for Intermittent Urinary Catheters. Now, this is a report coming from the Office of Audit Services. Medicare covers reasonable and necessary durable medical equipment, prosthetics, and orthotics, and supplies, or DME POS, such as intermittent urinary catheters. That's according to our Social Security Act, Section 1861N and Section S8, as well as in the Social Security Act 1862A1A. For calendar year 2021, Medicare has paid more than $308 million for intermittent urinary catheters. Prior reviews performed by the OIG and CMS contractors have identified high improper payment rates for urological supplies, including intermittent urinary catheters, that did not meet Medicare requirements. Upon request, a supplier must provide documentation from the physician or treating practitioner indicating that the urological supplies were reasonable and necessary for the beneficiary's condition. Now, the OIG will audit Medicare payments for for intermittent urinary catheters to determine whether claims submitted by DME POS suppliers complied with Medicare's requirements and guidance. Now, this final report is expected in fiscal year 2023. Now, the second OIG work plan update for July 2022 is titled Audit of the CDC's COVID-19 Vaccinate with Confidence Strategy. Now, this report is expected from the Office of Audit Services. The HHS announced the availability of $1 billion in Supplemental American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 funding for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, that's our CDC, to support its COVID-19 strategy called Vaccinate with Confidence, a strategy to reinforce confidence in COVID-19 vaccines. Now, this particular strategy includes building trust, empowering healthcare personnel, and engaging communities and individuals alike. The CDC defines, quote, vaccine confidence, end quote, as the belief that vaccines work, are safe, and are part of a trustworthy medical system. Strong confidence in COVID-19 vaccines within communities could lead to more adults, adolescents, and children getting vaccinated. 
from the $1 billion in supplemental funding the CDC awarded state, tribal, local, and territorial recipients a combined $250 million for developing and implementing a vaccine confidence strategy, supporting efforts to build vaccine confidence, and conducting outreach to build trust in COVID-19 vaccines, the healthcare personnel who provide them, and the system that approves and distributes them. These funds may be used for television, radio, internet, and other social media and communications technologies, used for in-person activities, be focused to address specific needs of communities and populations with low vaccination rates, and include the dissemination of scientific and evidence-based vaccine-related information. For the first audit, the OIG will determine how much of each state, tribal, local, and territorial recipients award had been expended at the time of the OIG's audit, identify the best practices used and potential barriers these recipients faced when spending the Supplemental American Rescue Plan funds, and determine whether the CDC provided oversight to these recipients in developing and implementing a vaccine confidence strategy. For the second audit, the OIG will determine whether select recipients used the Supplemental American Rescue Plan funding in accordance with federal requirements and applicable award terms and conditions for underserved communities. Now, this particular final report is expected in fiscal year 2024. Now, the third OIG work plan update for July 2022 is titled Audit of Indian Health Services Coordination of National and Regional Supply Service Center Operations to Distribute Supplies to Facilities. Now, this report is stemming from the Office of Audit Services. The Indian Health Service, the IHS, provides a comprehensive health service delivery system for approximately 2.6 million American Indians and Alaska Natives who belong to exactly 574 federally recognized tribes in 37 states. The IHS has a decentralized management structure that consists of two major components, headquarters that are housed in Rockville, Maryland, and 12 area offices in the nation. IHS's National Supply Service Center, or NSSC, serves as the distribution warehouse and supply distribution management center for IHS by providing supply support services and medical supplies to IHS federal and tribal hospitals, tribal health programs, and urban Indian organization health centers in all 12 IHS areas. Now, the NSSC director reports to the area director of the Oklahoma City area. Within IHS, but separate from NSSC, the Navajo area operates a Regional Supply Service Center, or RSSC, which is located in Gallup, New Mexico. The RSSC director reports to the area director of the Navajo area and has no reporting relationship to NSSC. RSSC provides medical supplies to the Navajo, Albuquerque, and Phoenix IHS areas. Facilities in these three areas can order and receive supplies from both NSSC and RSSC. Now, in a related audit, the OIG is examining NSSC's distribution of medical supplies and equipment during the COVID-19 pandemic. The OIG's objective is to determine whether IHS coordinated NSSC and RSSC operations to distribute supplies to facilities in an effective manner from January 1, 2019 through March 31, 2022. This final report is expected in fiscal year 2023. Now, the fourth OIG work plan update for July 2022 is titled Opioid Use in Medicare Part D in 2021, an annual review. Now, this report is stemming from the Office of Evaluation and Inspections. The opioid crisis remains a public health emergency. In 2021, there were nearly 103,000 opioid-related overdose deaths in the United States, 
Identifying patients who are at risk of overdose or abuse is key to addressing this crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic has made this need even more pressing. The pandemic has put people with opioid use disorder at particular risk as they are more susceptible to COVID-19 infection and are more likely to be hospitalized or die from the illness. This data brief would provide information on opioid utilization among beneficiaries enrolled in Medicare Part D in 2021. It would build off of the OIG series of annual reports. It will also provide 2021 data on the number of patients who received extreme amounts of opioids through Part D and those patients who appeared to be doctor shopping. It will also identify prescribers who ordered opioids for large numbers of these patients. In addition, it will also provide data on the number of patients receiving drugs to treat opioid use disorder and overdose reversal drugs. Now, this final report is expected in fiscal year 2022. Now, the fifth OIG work plan update for July 2022 is titled Congressional Mandate, Non-Covered Versions of Part B Drugs. Now, this report is coming from the Office of Evaluation and Inspections. Under the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, Congress enacted provisions requiring CMS to remove non-covered, self-administered versions of Simzia and Orencia from Part B payment amount calculations beginning in July 2021. Through the same legislation, Congress required the OIG to conduct periodic studies to identify additional instances in which included non-covered versions of a drug were increasing Part B reimbursement amounts. Now, in response, the OIG will conduct a study every six months to do these two things. Number one, identify any Part B drugs that have an overpayment amount based in part on non-covered self-administered versions of the drug. And number two, it will determine whether payment amounts would have decreased or increased if non-covered self-administered versions had been removed from payment amount calculations. Now, this final report is expected in fiscal year 2023. Now, the sixth and final OIG work plan update for July 2022 is titled Audit of National Institutes of Health's Data Integrity Controls for the Sequence Read Archive Data. Now, this report is coming from the Office of Audit Services. The National Center for Biotechnology Information, the NCBI, is part of the National Library of Medicine and hosts one of the National Institutes of Health's largest and most diverse data sets, known as the Sequence Read Archive, or the SRA. Now, this Sequence Read Archive, the SRA, is a broad collection of experimental DNA and RNA sequences that represent genome diversity. In 2019, the SRA held 9 million records in two formats. The original format of 23 petabytes is received by the NCBI from submitters and is instrumental and experimental specific. These data are stored to tape. Then the NCBI will transform these original data into standard SRA normalized format of 12.7 petabytes for redistribution. Now, through this SRA normalized database, which is cloud-based and accessed via the NCBI servers, researchers can search metadata to locate the sequence reads for further analyses. The SRA usage follows international nucleotide sequence database collaboration principles, which state that data are shared without restriction that the individual submitting the data must be the owner of the data, and that ownership of the data remains with the submitter even after submission. This audit will concentrate on system integrity controls, including malicious code protection and data input validation, as well as other federal requirements for normalizing and archiving the SRA data. The audit objective will be to determine whether the NIH has implemented adequate system integrity controls to ensure the reliability of the SRA data. This final report is expected in fiscal year 2022. 
All right, so those six OIG work plan items for July 2022 are going to be noteworthy when they come out in the years 2022, 2023, and 2024. So I know I'm in particular looking forward to and interested in diving into the why, right, for that first OIG work plan item that I addressed for July 2022. So the Medicare payment integrity issues are at play here, right, for some potential identified overpayments on the indwelling urinary catheters. Those are all in the spotlight. They're under the microscope, right? So in this particular work plan item, they address the issue of documentation requirements, right, are kind of not being met. So in this, in this instance for DME POS suppliers, these suppliers must be providing documentation from the physician or the treating practitioners that indicate the urological supplies were reasonable and necessary for the patient's condition. So we have to be mindful and ensure that documentation states the medical necessity, right? Like, is there an acute urinary retention issue happening with the patient or the patient simply cannot spontaneously void? We have to be documenting when those bladder scans are being performed, right? And document all of the findings from those bladder scans. So we need to continue to make sure that our physicians uh, and our nurses, our RNs, are ensuring that their daily documentation, right, is supporting the continuous need for those indwelling types of catheters. So in my opinion, again, I always pass this type of detailed information on to my providers who need it to review their coding and their billing practices or their overarching compliance programs. I think these reports with findings are always most interesting and informative, and I look forward to analyzing them in the years ahead. It's also important for my listeners to pay attention to these monthly OIG work plan updates to see how they may impact you, your provider, or your health system. And now it's time for my best practice tips, trusty tip. So in today's new back to basics compliance tip, I wanted to focus on documentation and billing of incident two services. Now, first of all, I have seen it done wrong time and time again. Why is there so much confusion over these years? So much confusion on how to properly document incident two services as well as bill incident two services on claims. Now, in my opinion, I think CMS has complicated the matter. The requirements they demand create so much burden on practice workflows and so much more. But on the flip side, CMS's ambiguity has allowed the various MACs, those are our Medicare administrative contractors, to come up with their own little web pages with fact sheets and their own little web pages with self service tools for our providers and practices to utilize. Now, regardless, Incident 2 billing has created again, an enormous spotlight on those practices for the volume of services that are provided by one physician's NPI number on billed claims, right? So it's that spotlight that's led to the gross, gross amount of overpayments over the years as well. So my question continues to be then, in my mind, is it really worth it to bill out incident to services when they're not being done compliantly. When you can just be billing out services that are rendered by the non-physician practitioners, those NPPs, at the 85% reimbursement rate. That's just some food for thought here. But I did discover a relatively easy to follow web page on the National Government Services. That's our MAC known as NGS. They have a really good fact sheet on Incident 2 services. So when you dig onto that page, they really identify and simplify the complicated resource that is the genesis of Incident 2 billing services, right? And that is the overall resource where all of this comes from, and that is from the Medicare manual. You will find it at the Medicare manual chapter, 
Chapter 15, Section 60 in our Medicare Benefits Policy Manual. Again, that's Chapter 15, Section 60. Now, if you dig into your own MAC web pages in your jurisdictions, they will all have those wonderful self-dedicated tools for you to use on Incident 2 services, as well as web pages of trying to truncate the complicated uh, resource in that chapter 15. So I really did enjoy what NGS has published. Now, in general, what the definition of Incident 2 is, is it's defined as services or supplies that are furnished Incident 2 a physician's professional services when the services or supplies are furnished as an integral although incidental part of the physician's personal professional services in the course of diagnosis or treatment of an injury or an illness and services are performed in the physician's office or in the patient's home. To qualify for payment under the incident two rules, services must be part of the patient's normal course of treatment during which a physician personally performed an initial service and remains actively involved in the ongoing course of treatment. Now, there are two ways in which office services may qualify for incident to billing. Now, the first way is those component services to be performed by a clinical office employee of the physician or the NPP who is the billing provider. Now, those employed clinical office staff may perform component functions as part of the billing provider's service or the administration of non-self-administrable drugs. Now, the service must represent an integral part of the patient's care and of a type commonly rendered in an office setting. Or, number two, it could also be full services that may be performed and billed incident two by Medicare enrolled NPPs within a group practice that employs both Medicare enrolled physicians and NPPs when incident two requirements are met. Now, in a group practice of Medicare enrolled physicians and NPPs, the NPP may perform a service under direct physician supervision, and the service may be billed under the physician's NPI if all incident two requirements are met. This rule applies to care for stable, established patients for whom the NPP is following a plan of care that was originally developed by the physician during which the physician is readily available in the office suite for any necessary supervision. Now, when these requirements are not met, the NPP's service must be billed with the NPP's NPI number. Now, the services must be medically reasonable and medically necessary and also within the scope of Medicare coverage and the billing provider's scope of practice. So this means that services that are not covered by Medicare, like massage therapy or spiritual counseling, these may not be included as part of the physician's service. And physicians may not bill services performed by non-Medicare enrolled physicians or NPPs. Also, providers may not bill incident two services by employed providers whose scope of practice exceeds their own. Like for example, a podiatry practice may employ a physician, but they may not bill the physician's services as incident to the podiatrist. Now, incident two concepts apply only, 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 only in the office setting. I can't stress that enough. So that means place of service 11. Now, the exception here is for home services for the homebound in medically underserved areas. Now, also the, the term clinic, of course, only applies as defined as a physician owned and operated clinic where providers work together in a large office. The concept does not apply to a hospital or to other facility based clinics. Now, the incident to service must be integral, although incidental. And that means when services are performed by employees of the provider, they must be an integral part of the provider's overall plan of care and essential to the patient's course of treatment, which means obtaining vital signs or administering an injection on the provider's behalf. 
Now, when the service is performed by a clinical employee without physician participation, right? Perhaps if all other incident two requirements are met, you can go ahead and bill that out under the physician's NPI as if the physician was there. And of course that direct supervision means the physician must be present in the office suite during the service and all other incident two requirements are met. Now, incident two billing does not apply to new patients or established patients who present with a new problem. That's also key to identify as a great criteria for incident two billing. So let me say that again. Incident two billing does not apply to new patients or established patients who present with new problems. So just like with all e &M services, the rendering provider must confirm the history of the present illness, the HPI, from the patient, since this requires clinical skill. When the HPI reveals a new problem or new problems, the visit cannot be incident to the NPP, since it may require changes to the physician's original plan of care. This visit can be performed and billed by either the, the actual physician or the actual NPP, but cannot be billed by the NPP using the physician's NPI or incident two. Now, services to new patients or established patients who present with new problems must be billed using the NPI of the provider who sees the patient that day. This means that such patients may be seen by, again, either the physician or the NPP within a practice, but that the service can only be billed under the physician's NPI when the physician actually sees the patient. And then NPPs who see patients in these circumstances must bill the service as performed by the NPP, because again, incident two qualifications are not met. Now, services to establish patients with no new problems may be provided by NPPs and billed under the NPI of the supervising physician, as long as the physician is immediately available in the office suite and the NPP is following that plan of care that's been set forth by the physician on the initial visit. So that would follow incident two requirements. And then of course you have to record the actual um, notes from the physician's initial visit. So the medical record must reflect an initial physician visit and the periodic reviews and the periodic oversights by the physician of his or her initial plan of care as administered and followed through by the NPP. Now visits with established patients who are experiencing new problems require active physician participation and cannot be billed on an incident to basis. For all patients, it's expected that the physician performs and documents intermittent subsequent services of a frequency that reflects our active participation of the course of treatment for the specific problem, which means as an auditor, I want to see that physician seeing the patient from time to time, like on the third visit, the fifth visit, the ninth visit, etc. Then, incident two billing for visits including medication adjustments. So NGS has stated here that a physician's initial plan of care may include prescription medication that may require adjustment on subsequent visits. The need for medication adjustment does not represent a new problem. These visits may be billed by an NPP as incident to the original plan of care when the physician includes that instruction in the original plan. Like NGS even gives an example quote, have started the patient on Lozartan 100 milligrams for blood pressure 160 over 90, patient to return to the office in two weeks for follow-up. Dosage may be adjusted by the NPP on follow-up visits, end quote. So that's a great example of what to include in the doctor's original plan of care. Document that that patient will be coming in for subsequent follow-up visits on prescription medication refills and reviews, and that can be performed by the NPP. Then, direct supervision by a physician is required. 
Incident 2 billing requires direct supervision by the supervising physician who must be present in the office suite and immediately available and able to provide assistance and direction throughout the time the service is performed. The supervising physician does not have to be in the same room, but must be in the office or the clinic suite. And for group practices, any physician member of the group may provide supervision to the NPPs under this guideline. That's a great reminder. So our physicians can't be golfing on the golf course. They have to be immediately available in the office suite to perform any guidance that the NPP needs. And then also remember that any other physician in that group who is available in the office suite at the time the patient is being seen can be immediately available for assistance to that NPP. That's a great reminder. And then for documentation, documentation must support evidence that a supervising physician was present and available. The documentation submitted to support billing incident to services must clearly link the services of the NPP staff to the services of the supervising physicians. Evidence of that link may include things like, you know, while that co-signature of the supervising physician is not required, it's a very good recommendation to include that in there. So it's definitely suggested, I suggest it all the time, that you have some sort of a notation like that within your EMR system. So some sort of a co-signature that the supervising physician was there. The NPP performing the service may include an entry in the note of the identity and the credentials of the supervising physician who was available during the visit. And I've helped many a doctor include language like that in their notes. Now, documentation from other dates of service, both the initial and subsequent, should clearly establish a link between the two providers, the NPP as well as that MD. All right. Now, all of those incident two details can be found, of course, at the source itself. In the Medicare Benefits Policy Manual, Chapter 15, Section 60. But I hope my going over the wonderful facts on the NGS website for Incident 2 Services, their little fact sheet, I thought just provided so much necessary truncated details on billing and documentation for Incident 2 Services compliantly. So what do you guys think you'll be doing about Incident 2 billing moving forward? It's fundamental, if you have Medicare as a payer, to keep your eye on correct and compliant coding and billing practices and make sure that you are adhering to all of them to ensure that you are meeting the medical necessity from the very start. Because when the documentation paints the medical picture with clarity and with vibrancy from the onset of care, a certified medical coder can then abstract codes with accuracy. And finally, I focus Season 6's Spark on vision and leadership. I want this sixth season Spark to be filled with the world's thought leaders, writers, artists, philosophers, everyone who inspires the need for vision and leadership in all we strive to do. So, in this week's inspiring quote, in Spark is from Ashita Gupta. Making the decision to not follow a system or someone else's rules has allowed me to really dig into what my own strengths and gifts are without spending time feeling jaded or wasteful. Absolutely true, right? I think this quote inspires us. It reminds us that we all have unique ideas, unique gifts that may not always fit within the norm. It's important to recognize a visionary, a leader, supports these types of ideas and gifts. They support these types of people. This quote reminds us that we all have this capability within us. This quote inspires us to allow those ideas and gifts to come to the surface. This quote inspires us to let our own visions soar. I am happy Ishita Gupta's spark still burns brightly in all of us today. 
So that wraps up today's episode. And as always, I appreciate you all diving into today with me. If you want more information from me, please go ahead and follow me on LinkedIn. I'll leave links to everything in the show notes below. Please have an amazing week ahead and please continue staying safe and healthy. Thank you so much for listening in on today's episode. And I hope every week with me brings you closer to helping your providers paint a masterpiece. See you next Wednesday.